I'm behind the times. <laughs> Can we library board please come to order? Please. Trustee Craven? Here. Trustee Kildee? Here. Trustee Little? Here. Mayor Pro Tem McDonald? Here. President Morgan. Present. Um, can we please rise for the flag salute? Uh, Mr. Little, would you lead us in the flag salute? Yes. Please join me in saluting our flag of our country. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, this is the time we have, it's time for public comments on items that are not on the agenda. Is there anyone who wishes to address the library board this evening? I don't have any blue card. Any. Okay, D did she give, get a blue card, Madeline? Okay. Wrong meeting. Oh. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Seeing there's no one uh, to address this this evening, let's move forward. Uh, con uh, consent calendar. Move the approval. A motion for approval. Second. We have a second. Please vote. We had no departmental items and no legal counsel. In fact, I better ask legal counsel. Do you have anything that you would like to say? Not tonight. Bruce, anything you'd like to address the council on this? I have no comments. Okay. Any comments from our board members? Seeing none, we will we will adjourn at this time and come back on July June twenty fifth. Call a meeting of the Camarillo Sanitary District Board of Directors to order and ask the re record to reflect that all board members are present. Are there any amendments to this agenda? There's no amendments. Uh, public comments. I don't have any cards for the Camarillo Sanitary District Board. Would anyone like to talk to us on an item that's not on the agenda? Seeing no one come forward, we'll move on to the consent calendar. Move the approval. Second. The so motion is second. Uh, please vote. Oh, I can't see yours, Mike. I, Mine is, yes. Uh, motion carries unanimously. Um, any comments from staff? No comments. Comments from board members? No comments. Meeting adjourned. I'd like to call the Camarillo Successor Agency special meeting for June 11th to order, please and let the record remember, uh, reflect that all members are present. Amendments to this agenda? No amendments. No amendments. Public comments on the successor agency? No, okay. Uh, we'll go down to item three, that's a consent calendar. Move the approval. Okay. There's a motion and a second. Any further discussion, please uh, vote. And that passes unanimously. Uh, item four is departmental. Long range property management plan to transfer title of real property. Do we have a staff report on this? Yes, Mr. Perrick will provide that. Okay, Mr. Perrick. Yes, as the uh, council knows, the um, state adopted uh, AB 26 and later AB 1484 to dissolve um, redevelopment agencies. And pursuant to that process, um, we were able to proceed with the submission to the uh, oversight board and eventually the state uh, Department of Finance a, a proposed long range property management plan. Um, that plan was amended slightly based on input from the um, state Department of Finance. And um, we are very pleased to report report to you tonight that that uh, long-range property management plan has been approved by the Department of Finance. Um, this would apply to five properties um, that were formerly owned by the Community Development Department, those being the former fire station on Ventura Boulevard in, the, in Old Town, the hotel conference center, uh, proposed hotel conference center location at Ventura Boulevard and Las Posas Road, uh, the third one being the former courthouse building on Ventura Boulevard in Old Town. The fourth one is a 12-acre site that's west of Home Depot, um, and the last one being uh, Palm Drive parking easements. The former courthouse and the parking easements are being transferred, uh, proposed to be transferred by the successor agency to the city for 
governmental use, and the other three properties uh, would be transferred by the successor agency to the city for future development. So the item before you tonight uh, is uh, requesting that you authorize the city manager to sign the deeds um, from the successor agency uh, that would then transfer title uh, to the, from the successor agency to the city of Camarillo. There is a companion item on your uh, agenda for the city council that would uh, authorize acceptance of those deeds. Uh, included in the packet is the approval letter from the state for the long range property management plan. I should mention, and this is on page big uh, five of your packet, the June 2nd letter from the Department of Finance uh, regarding the long range property management plan in case you had a question on this, uh, on the last paragraph, there's a reference to the property being transferred um, to the Community Redevelopment Property Trust Fund of the successor agency. Um, what that involves is basically a fund of the successor agency. It is an accounting function um, to be able to have a placeholder for the properties within the successor agency. However, now that the Long Range Property Management Plan has been approved, we are authorized to have the successor agency execute the deed to transfer title to the city. So that trust fund is not a separate legal entity. and We don't need to physically transfer a deed uh, to that trust fund. So I wanted to make sure that that, that was clear. So the proposed action tonight would be to authorize the city manager to execute the deeds to transfer title to the five properties listed in the agenda um, the, to the uh, city of Camarillo. And attachment one is a listing of those uh, properties um, in terms of their um, uh, assessor parcel numbers, because there's some of these uh, parcels have multiple properties located uh, within them. So I'm prepared to answer any questions. Questions from the I do. I did have a question on that paragraph that you explained, and boy, in reading it, it sure doesn't say what you just said it says. So you're saying that even though it tells us upon finding a, a upon receiving a finding of completion, which we have, and approval of a long range property management plan, then it goes on to say all real property. So what's the difference between what it says in that paragraph and what we got? Well, um, the reasoning on this is that the um, health and safety code section that applies here is section 34191.5A, and it makes reference to the Community Redevelopment Property Trust Fund administered by the successor agency. So that is a fund of the successor agency. And when it talks about the properties being transferred to that fund, that is the place within the successor agency where those properties would have been listed when you looked at the accounting records. Um, and in terms of my answer that that is an accounting process rather than a title issue, um, I can say that we have confirmed that with the city's auditor uh, and, and Ronnie Campbell made that contact, Bob Callanan. I also confirmed that with uh, one of the partners of my firm who basically specializes in redevelopment law as well, that it is an accounting function, not a title issue. So what does the section 3419.4 mean? Because that's the one it's referring to, and you just said 0. 0.5. Well, 34191.5 is the one that talks about establishing the fund. 34191.4 says that um, all real property and interests identified shall be transferred to the community redevelopment property trust fund of the successor agency upon approval of the long range property management plan. Now, basically what that means, the way we understand it and the way it's been reviewed by the auditor as well as legally, is that uh, that is a fund of the successor agency where the property is held. But, but since our long range property management plan provides for the property to be transferred from the successor agency, what we can now do is, and in our long range property management plan specifically says that, that the properties will be transferred from the successor agency, if you will, from this fund, uh, uh, an arm of the successor agency, to the city. Okay, I get it now. So the key word here is of the agency, and of the agency in this case is the city of Camarillo, not the successor agency. Hmm. 
Well, I think it refers to successor agency, but what it's saying is the, the <laughs> I know that the semantics of this are not the easiest to understand, but the, the fund is a fund of the successor agency, and that is the place where title was being, or where the properties were being accounted for, if you will. The fund itself has no separate legal existence. The only two legal entities that are in play here are the successor agency and the city. Those two entities can hold titled property. The title is currently held by the successor agency. Assuming you approve this item tonight, there will be a deed that will be signed by the successor agency transferring those properties to the city, which is what it says in our long-range property management plan is going to happen. Can, can I ask a question? Sure. And, and that, we're allowed to do that because the property management plan says we can do it. Exactly. And it was approved by the Department of Finance. Exactly. And why in the world did they put this sentence in that letter, or that paragraph in the letter? Which well, it's Because they're accountants and they don't speak English. Hey. They speak finance. <laughs> Then why can't I understand? I mean, they should have left that whole paragraph out, is basically what you're saying, because it didn't apply to us? Well, if I wrote the letter, I would have left it out, but uh, they wrote it, so um, we just if have they to. If wrote it, then it should apply to us. Well, okay. well I'm, I'm going to have to trust you on this May one. May I add this additional comment? I did have conversation with the auditors. Unfortunately, we're kind of as we are with a lot of the successor agency stuff, we're on the cutting edge. But you are correct, what it would show ultimately in final presentation of the financial statement. <laughs> The only correction to what Mr. Perrick said is that it would then show on the city side in a trust fund per the approved okay. long-range property management plan. So, so the assets are not valued in a private trust fund of the successor agency, but more so of the city. And that is what we believe the reference when it says agency, okay. it's the city of Camarillo. So when I came to that conclusion, then that's what makes it okay. Okay. Then my next question has to do with the next paragraph. And that says the agency's actions taken pursuant to a finance-approved appro finance long-range property management plan, which requires the agency to enter into a new agreement. Does that include um, any of the um, compensation agreements? They don't say in this letter whether they do or they don't. Um, this language could uh, relate, if we're going to speculate on it, which we really have to do at this point, um, to an agreement for the disposition of the property. Um, sometimes that's referred to as the post-PMP approval process. And whether the state does or doesn't have any ability to, uh, or the oversight board ability to approve our development projects still remains an open question. The fact is that our long-range property management plan, because I wrote this part of it, says that we don't need to have any post-PMP approval. So there is some pending legislation that hopefully will provide some clarity on that issue, um, uh, SB 1129. Um, I guess the best answer I can give to all these questions tonight is there's one thing we know for sure, that we do have the ability tonight to do what we're asking you to do, which is to transfer title from these five properties from the successor agency to the city. And then whether or not that will future uh, actions by the city with regard to those properties are going to require any further involvement by the oversight board and the uh, State Department of Finance is open to question. We don't think it does, and but nonetheless, we will address those issues as they arise. If I could add to that, your a, a direct answer to your question on whether that sentence refers to a future compensation agreement, the answer, in my opinion, because nothing's 100 percent, is 99.9 .9, no. It does not relate to the compensation agreements. That is a 99.9 .9 percent going to occur at the local level with us and our local taxing agencies. It will not include the, the city. Yes, it will not include the State Department of Finance, the Oversight Board, and even the successor agency at this point. Okay. Sorry to question you, but we've been here, done this before, so. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Those properties have gone back and forth a few times. Okay, thank you. And we did try to avoid that, but the state controller told us that we needed to transfer it back. So, mm -hmm. I think they also have form letters, and we're somewhat of. Uh, I noticed there's a line here missing. So yeah, missing and I, th I think, yeah. Okay. Any other questions, Your Honor? Yes. Uh, I move to. Where is it? I had it at one time. I move to authorize the city manager to sign the deeds for the properties listed in the attachment one, transferring title of these properties from the Camarillo Successor Agency to the city of Camarillo. 
Second. There's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, please vote. Okay, that passes unanimously. Uh, okay, uh, comments from the staff? Any more comments on this? I have no comments. Any comments from the board members? I uh, just want to. Mr. Little? Yeah, I've, I've been on this council for 18 months, and this seems to have consumed a good part of every, every month of that for me, and I know for the rest of the council, it's consumed much more time than that. And, but I do think our city uh, staff, uh, attorney and manager, uh, directors and so forth worked, uh, worked through this very, sure very uh, expeditiously and uh, we put it out on the other end, hopefully with some properties that we can uh, see that will enhance the city at, as a result of it. Good. Mr. Uh, Morgan? You know, I just added to that a little bit because, uh, you know, if you look at other cities, Many of them aren't even close to what we've done. I think our staff's done a fantastic job in, quote, recovering these properties, uh, basically. And uh, now we can move forward. Instead of having to wait and fight and hope, uh, we're well ahead of a lot of cities. Yeah. And the long, yes, I want to thank staff, too. You, you guys did a great job. And uh, this is going to benefit not just the city, but all of the other agencies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because we're going to be able to move forward on some of this stuff we've wanted to do for some of it's 10, 15 years. Good job. Yeah, like one to, thing in particular, <laughs> 15 years. I'd like to thank the staff, too, for a lot of really good heavy lifting and hard work. Thank you, and we appreciate the council's support and your patience. It's been an up-and-down trip. Okay. With that, we'll adjourn this meeting. And I will call the regular city council meeting for June 11th to order, please. And let the record reflect that all the council, me council members are present. Uh, amendments to this agenda? Mr. Uh, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I do have one amendment under closed session, page four of your city council agenda. Okay. Item A, conference with labor negotiators. We should um, omit that. We don't need that. So your closed session will be just the one item, item B. Okay. And those are the only amendments I have. Okay. Your Honor, I have a request. All right. Uh, let's see. Will that one, Bruce, is that going to be brought back or is that just unneeded? The That's unneeded. Unneeded. Okay. All right. Uh, Mrs. McDonald, did you yes, have something? Yes, on the consent calendar, I'd like to pull item C. Okay, let me get down to that. Okay, we'll go to consent item. Let's see, it's item C. Um, Kathy's here. We don't have a human resources tab. So where's it go? City manager? Oh, it's under city manager. Hold on here, let me find Mr. City Manager. Where are we? Okay, city manager, and that is item C, right? Yes. Okay, anything else, Ms. McDonald? No, thank you. Okay, Mr. Little? I, I'd like to uh, pull item E. E is an Earl? Yes. Okay. Where city, would you like uh, to? I guess city council. That would be city council. At the beginning. Might as well I think do that's that the first city time. clerk, isn't it? City clerk? Mm -hmm. City clerk, yeah, sure. Okay, let me, let me get to that uh, city. No, hang on. Mm -hmm. Item. C, and that is item E, right? Item E, okay. Anything else from anybody else? All right. Motion? Well, I'll, I'll move the consent calendars uh, with the exception of item C and E. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Please vote. Okay, that passes unanimously. Okay. So that is going to get us down to item four, which is city council invocation at council meetings. Do we have a staff report on that? I have um, some very brief comments as a, as a um, just more of an introduction, and then I was going to turn the, the microphone over to Council members um, Little and, and Morgan um, in that this was um, their request uh, for more detail. And then I, I would add that staff is prepared to answer any questions, um, should there be any, and to remind the council that in accordance with policy, 
this item is brought before you to to consider for a future agenda. It's not about uh, this evening about actually making a decision on, on which direction you want to go on the subject matter. Uh, my basic comment was um, in accordance with policy 1.04. Um, as your city manager, I am supposed to bring these back in this format um, for public discussion um, on items that are not related to regular city business, and this would not be a regular city business item. And I would, um, I would leave it at that at this point and turn this over to uh, Council Members Little and Morgan. Okay. Mr. Your Honor. Little and Mr. Morgan, I believe you. I think Mike wants to. 20 years ago, we had prayer, opening prayer, invocation at the City Hall. Um, we stopped having that, even though the county and some other cities still continue with it. You know, um, Wyneme and Simi Valley and so on. What had caused some uh, concern was uh, the fact that decisions had been made about invocations that included some sort of reference to a specific denomination prayer in, in, in prayer. But the Supreme Court, um, not Supreme Court, the appellate court, has now ruled that uh, invocations are fine as long as there's no denominational type prayer. It's a, uh, you can't mention Mohammed or Jesus, things like that. You have to have a non-denominational prayer. And I thought it might be time to bring that back. And so um, we looked at it and thought, you know, we did it before. Other people are doing it. Even the Congress does it. So I, I don't see any harm. So yeah, I just want to, uh, the, uh, the Supreme Court has uh, indicated that uh, it's appropriate to have a non-denominational prayer, uh, a contemplative prayer. And uh, I know, as Mike said, there's all sorts of governmental units uh, up and down the country that uh, do this. At one point in time, we had it. Uh, it was uh, it was part of the uh, opening uh, ritual of the of the city council, and for various reasons, it was uh, decided not to pur pursue it. Uh, I would I would think we ought to, uh, since there is a look at it. Um, a n large number of people in this community that uh, that uh, have some uh, religious affiliation. I think it would be appropriate for us to uh, have a, uh, a set up with the ministerial alliance where they would provide ministers and, and rabbis or priests and so forth to come and uh, on a rotating basis and uh, open the city council meetings with that, that sort of uh, contemplated prayer. Your Honor. Yes, uh, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Craven. Um, my memory is, and we had prayer when I started on the council, and mm -hmm. then we didn't for a while. The reason we didn't was because, well, first of all, our, our meetings are on Wednesday nights, and the pra and in the past when we've had prayer, it's been at the 7:30 session. Uh, most of the Protestant churches have Wednesday evening services, and so it was very difficult for their uh, ministers to come. Uh, the sec we tried it again, I believe, at the request of Council Member Martin, and uh, we had a, at the beginning, we had a lot of uh, people who were willing to come and, and recite the prayer, and then it fell to uh, Council Member Martin, who uh, if you might remember, said the, the prayer many, many, many nights, and finally we decided to not have it. It was the same reason, because it was Wednesday night. Um, and we did get our ministers from the Ministerial Association. I think it's fine to bring it back as, as a future agenda, uh, agenda item and discuss it and make a decision. Uh, and I think we'll probably find a lot of enthusiasm at the beginning, and maybe it won't wane off this time. Any other comments? I think um, one thought might be to, rather than having it every meeting, that we introduce it at certain events or at certain times or for certain reasons. So instead of every Wednesday night at 7.30, which it wouldn't be the start of a meeting, it would be in the middle of our meeting, but, but because it's now you know, the Supreme Court or the appellate court, whoever it was, says it's fine to do it in a governmental meeting, that, that you do it at, you know, let's take our 50th anniversary, which is a special occasion at that night. Or, and that way we might be able to find people you know, that could, could participate more. Bring it back at a meeting and discuss mm -hmm. it. 
Well, I'm saying that because maybe when it comes back as a as an agenda item, we might have a list of those kind of events where we could introduce it without having it at every single meeting. I would also like to know exactly who is um, doing it now and who's not as far as other cities and so forth when it comes back. We are locally or across the nation because you're going to find 90 percent do. Well, I'd like to know, well, well, I guess if you want to go across the nation, I would like Ventura County. I mean, obviously that's where we are. Or California, but I don't know if I'd go clear across the nation. And we could include in the um, report to you an analysis of the legal issues. Um, and it was the United States Supreme Court um, uh, that made the decision. Uh, it was in the town of Greece, uh, New York. Uh, that was involved in that case and was decided on May 5th of 2014. So we would certainly include a discussion of that case in the report back to you. Particularly if it's, I don't, I remember reading it in the paper, I don't know if it was some special circumstance that, or if it was just a very broad brush or, so appreciate that. Well, the opinion itself is 76 pages long, so I'll try to distill it maybe to... <laughs> we don't want you to read it to us. Uh, well, uh, well, okay, <laughs> synopsis, if, you, if, if you're going to be that way. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll see if I can give you the short version. Mr. Little, I think you had a... Yeah, I think uh, as far as the timing is concerned, uh, we can certainly uh, uh, perhaps uh, start to uh, do the five, uh, five o'clock, uh, uh, have it at five o'clock. There's nothing that says we have to have it at seven. And that should get uh, out from under the problem of this conflict that you mentioned, uh, uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Craven. And... Uh, I think probably before, you know, obviously what we would need to do would be to uh, uh, sit down with the ministerial group and talk to them and see if they're going to have a, uh, a scheduling problem. With, well, we certainly don't want to get into it ourselves. But that's something we can, I think right now we just need to go ahead and say let's look into it and everything. We could, we could in the report give you a lot of your options, including whether it's 530, 730. One of the main features of the um, Town of Greece case was that the prayer could not be uh, denigrating to other religions or mm -hmm. proselytized, trying to convert. Um, so uh, if the council were inclined to proceed with the invocation, there will be a number of issues that you're going to need to address, um, and we can put that in the report. Good. Did it talk at all about those who do not believe? Mm -hmm. And their rights. Yes, the, the town of Greece case does talk about that case and it, mm -hmm. uh, about that situation, and it expressly says that um, if there was any evidence that those who don't wish to participate in the prayer, um, uh, th that the fact that they don't wish to doesn't mean that it creates an issue for them unless there was some evidence that they were being discriminated against because they did not participate in the prayer. Okay. I had a chance to talk to a couple to see what they would say. Rabbi Lang, and then a couple others, Rep. Father Mullen, and a couple of Protestant ministers, and they'd be happy to have this back again. So uh, we've got some enthusiasm to bring it back. Okay, I have a couple of uh, comments. Maybe staff can do some research. I'd like to see with the ruling if it, we can, uh, if it's limited to Christian and Jewish, mm -hmm. or will we have to allow anybody else to come in? Uh, with any type of denomination that they believe in. Uh, maybe you can get some research on that. And also the ministerial association, if we could limit it to just one association, or do we have to open it up to any other association that perhaps might be interested in doing this? Maybe you could get some information uh, back on that. Certainly. And whether or not it can be a silent prayer or does it have to be uh, a public prayer? In other words, my understanding way back in the old days that the council members were the ones that actually led uh, the prayer on this and I'm not sure legally if we could do it that way or do you have to bring a public uh, uh, person in to do this? Kevin, we did both ways. We did uh, the, the ministerial association from the beginning used to come through and do the prayer. But so it's time, not like well, there, there were times, times that, yeah, that there, right, when they were missing, there, they would not so, show up uh, for yeah, whatever various just, reasons. Tom probably, Martin uh, did. Tom Martin and I think a couple others at the time did uh, mm -hmm. did step in and do it. But uh, of course, that was 25 years into the city. I think Kevin yeah. was talking about originally. Mm -hmm. Originally, it's when they started with the uh, ministerial association doing opening prayer. It wasn't from the board members. 
I used to go to some, excuse me, I'm dating myself now, <laughs> but I was like early 20s and I've been to their meetings over there on Palm Street. Okay, is there anything else, any, this is a time to bring up if any others have any questions about this so staff can look into it and bring it back to us. Anything else, anybody? I would move to bring this back for discussion and a decision with all of, with the report that gives us answers to all of the questions that we have had here tonight. Could that just be a direction, or do we need to vote on that? Or just said yeah, I, I, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, I think you can. Um, you certainly give direction to staff. You can go ahead and vote on that to bring it back to a future agenda. Okay. It's on your agenda to give direction, so okay. you can go, go so ahead. So moved. Second. Well, you need a second. Okay. Mike so made the. I made the. You made the ocean and uh, motion, and Mike, did you second it? Second. Okay. So, please. Go. Uh, that passes unanimously. Okay, that gets us down to item B, which is a citizen appointment committee recommendation. Do we have a staff report on that? Sure, a very brief one. As um, you may recall, we had two unscheduled vacancies on the ranch board, and so we posted the required notice. We did not get any new applications, but the citizen appointment committee went back to the applications we received in January and have recommended two appointees as indicated in your report. And I believe you got those applications <coughs> for your review. And I don't know if the committee has any comments they want to add. Any report from the committee members on this? Well, we, uh, yeah, uh, just a very brief report. We, uh, as you know, we had a number of applicants from the uh, first part of this year who uh, uh, filled three vacancies at that time in January. And we were able to find uh, two very well qualified people. Uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Maxwell, who's a chiropractor in the city of, uh, he lives in the city of Camarillo, he does not practice in the city. And uh, uh, Miss uh, Diana, who uh, is uh, a uh, county planner. For Just the city. for the record, it's Mr. N Dr. Newman. No, I'm sorry. I'm, did I say I, Maxwell? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, it's Mr. Newman. I'm sorry. I was close. Was, <laughs> but uh, we uh, we were able to get, find those people uh, from the exist, so that's why it's here. And a quick quick turnaround for these vacancies. As as you as the other part of the committee, as you know, the the Ranch Foundation Board is the committee that we get the most applicants who want to wanting to serve on uh, it's a very popular board and we have rarely have vacancies on it so this is a, a first I think other than the very beginning when we've had in one short four or five month period uh, five vacancies to fill uh, these people were they looked very good to us at the beginning it was just that uh, other people were appointed and uh, I think these people will work out very well one of the things that we being on the board with Bill or uh, on the Ranch House Foundation Board, we there's something coming forward to us. There's possibly three new, pe three different people retiring, two for sure, and maybe a third now retiring from the board by the end of the year. So we got to keep that in mind. So when we start filling these positions, it uh, needs to be workers. We need to we need, we need people that want to be involved out there and not just show up for a meeting. I think it's good to get people with fresh ideas and mm -hmm. and. Enthusiasm, not that the other people don't or haven't had, but often uh, when you get new people, uh, you get a lot of good ideas. That so, uh, there's. I would uh, move the approval of these people for the board. I'll oh, second. There's a motion to second. Any further discussion here? Now, please vote. Uh, that passes unanimously. Okay, that gets down to the city attorney. It's the acceptance of the real property from the Camarillo successor agency to the city of Camarillo. Yeah, this is, uh, this is deja vu all over again. Um, we just had this uh, successor agency item to uh, authorize the transfer of those five properties from the successor agency to the city. Uh, this is a companion item uh, to allow for the uh, uh, city manager to sign the acceptance of the deeds for those five properties. Are there any questions for Councilor at this time? Yeah, I think we discussed that a lot, so I'm ready. Move the approval. Is there a second? A second. The motion and a second. Uh, please vote. Uh, that passes unanimously. <coughs> okay, let's get down to item B. 
That's the ordinance 1088 amending the smoking regulations to include e-cigarettes. Councillor, do you want to? Yes, I'll, I'll handle that one. Um, as the council would recall, on May 14th of 2014, uh, there were two actions taken. One was to introduce by first reading an am uh, amendment of uh, Chapter 9.24 of the re smoking regulations in Camarillo to include uh, electronic smoking devices, um, basically put the same limitations on um, place time um, for uh, those use of those devices as you have for smoking of uh, tobacco products. Um, there was also an urgency ordinance as a temporary moratorium adopted at that time with respect to the establishment of new electronic smoking businesses. There were a couple of questions that came up uh, at the meeting on May 14th. Um, uh, one of them uh, dealt with the question of the effect of the ordinance on existing uh, electronic smoking lounges. The second one uh, had to do with uh, whether there was, uh, we could get some more information for you on the extent of the potential health issues uh, related to electronic smoking. Uh, we have answers to both those questions in the agenda report that's before you. Um, the ordinance, uh, we added uh, uh, some language to section uh, 9.24030. That's at the bottom of page, big page one of the uh, staff report. And basically we said that the restrictions that apply to smoking lounges in terms of whether they could be an inline type store or a standalone uh, location. Um, that would apply except that um, smoking would be permissible in smoking lounges that are legally in operation on the effective date of this ordinance at their current location even if said smoking lounges are in basically an inline store. So that takes care of that first question. The second question dealt with uh, whether we could get some additional information on the potential health effects of electronic smoking devices. Um, the agenda report beginning at big page two um, uh, includes a discussion of the various um, uh, articles and other information sources that we were able to obtain on that. We did provide you again the copy of the, the statement that had been issued by the American Lung Association. Uh, that article had referenced the uh, 2009 FDA study, so um, we obtained a copy of that press release from the FDA, which is attachment four in your uh, agenda packet. Um, that laboratory analysis, according to the FDA, found that e-cigarettes contained carcinogens and toxic chemicals such as, I'll probably butcher this name, I think it's diethylene glycol, um, an ingredient used in antifreeze. Um, we also have the city of San Francisco adopted the or, uh, an ordinance, you saw, you saw that previously, in which uh, they make reference to um, findings of the CDC study with respect to the increased use of e-cigarettes by uh, youth. So I was able to obtain a copy of those S, uh, CDC articles, which are attachments six and seven in your packet. Those basically show that there has been an increase in use of electronic cigarettes by middle and high school students. Um, there's also a reference to the increased calls to poison control. Uh, attachment eight is an article from the official journal of the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, addressing the issue of uh, advertising um, and how it's um, being focused on uh, the youth. Uh, in addition, there's a Wall Street Journal article, a fairly recent one, May 30th of 2014, it's attachment nine, about the rapidly expanding electronic smoking business. So that was information that we obtained from our independent research. We also had input from the Ventura County uh, Public Health Department um, that included the articles that appear in attachments um, 10, um, which is an article from the Ventura County Star, Dr. Levin from the um, Ventura County Public Health, the uh, health officer who's with us tonight, um, and uh, referring to electronic smoking as being a gateway to uh, for youth to uh, smoking of uh, traditional tobacco products. There's also two articles that were published by the University of California, San Francisco, um, that were submitted by uh, the department, um, and those are attachments 11 and 12, which refer to the health effects of electronic cigarettes. Um, we, in addition, we had information that was submitted by Mike Mirabel, um, and, and that information uh, is attachment 13 in your packet. Um, 
to summarize that, the articles that were submitted by Mr. Mirabel, uh, I did not see that they indicated that there were no health risks associated with electronic smoking devices. I think some of the articles uh, tended to try to minimize the effects, but I didn't see any place that said there weren't any. Um, and some of the articles had been funded by the e-cigarette business community, so to whatever extent that might have influenced their conclusions, I don't know. Um, so uh, the item before you tonight is uh, presented for a second reading uh, of the ordinance as it was presented to you on May 14th. Uh, I can answer any questions, and then I think there's maybe some members of the public that wish to speak on this. Any questions at this time? Just have one quick one. Can minors buy e-cigarettes? No. Mm -mm. That's the one state law um, that there is. Um, state law is very uh, minimal on the issue of e-cigarettes. I don't know that that means that it won't um, catch up with um, the, the status of them, but um, there is a state law that does prohibit minors from purchasing them. And that's the only state law regulating That's the only one that I know of, yeah. Mr. Little, do you have a question? No, this, for the public's sake, this still means that they have to be 25, 25 feet from a door of an entrance to a business, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so everybody's understanding. exactly. Right. Ba basically, this chapter 9.24 of our municipal code sets forth certain rules with respect to where you can smoke mm -hmm. tobacco products. And what we have done with the amendment to our ordinance is to treat the use of electronic smoking devices and the restrictions of where you can smoke them um, to the same extent that apply to smoking of tobacco products. Okay. And, and I should mention a number of cities have done this. Um, I mentioned tonight the city of San Francisco. I know um, that the city of Los Angeles has also adopted a similar ordinance um, and, and a number of other cities as well. Mr. Little, did you have a question? Uh, we've got a couple comments. I don't think I have any questions. Well, uh, my suggestion is we might want to defer comments until after the public sure. has spoken. Okay, exactly. I do have a, I do have a, a question. Um, how does this affect the sale and use of the e-cigarettes from products sold in grocery stores and drug stores and so forth? If they are uh, legally operating now, it does not affect them. So, so even though we uh, make sure that we don't have any more of these uh, smoke uh, vapor shops or whatever they call it, people will be buying these cigarettes uh, from from the ones that are grandfathered or uh, under still allowed under the emergency ordinance, or from uh, say Vons or somebody. Else. Yeah, the answer is yes. Okay. Any other Bill. questions? They'll then have the same restrictions. They have to be behind. Uh, 25 feet from the door and all that stuff. No, that's for using them. If you buy them, they'll, in order to get them, you'll have to have a clerk get them for you. They have to be behind the counter, just like cigarettes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Yeah, which they aren't right now in all stores. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, have a couple of blue cards. I'll call Robert Levin. Robert here, Dr. Levin. Uh, let me make sure that, that, yeah, I think it's on. If you could just put that microphone kind of close to you, I'd appreciate it. All right. Um, how's that? Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, Mr. Sfang and Pyrrhic. Uh, my name is Robert Levin, Dr. Levin. I'm the county health officer and medical director with the Ventura County Department of Public Health. Thank you very much for allowing me to speak tonight. E-cigarettes are increasing in popularity and acceptance. E-cigarettes are nicotine delivery devices which seek to normalize the use of tobacco products intended to make us believe that it is a safe alternative to smoking. They're often advertised as a medically proven alternative for tobacco cessation. Yet research has shown that when it comes to quitting smoking, there's no statistically significant difference between nicotine e-cigarettes, nicotine patches, and placebo e-cigarettes. All e-cigarettes contain both nicotine and propylene glycol. As delivered in e-cigarettes, propylene glycol is a known carcinogen. Both the e-cigarette smoker and those around them 
are exposed to the substance. Since there are no FDA restrictions on the production or contents of e-cigarettes, the constituents can vary from brand to brand and even from batch to batch within a brand. E-cigarettes, depending on the brand, may also contain diethylene glycol, heavy metals including lead, cadmium, chromium, and silicate nanoparticles, volatile organic acids such as benzene and toluene, and tobacco-specific nitrosamines, which are the same carcinogens found in tobacco and tobacco smoke. It is an unavoidable conclusion that e-cigarettes are harmful based on their ingredients and the known effects of their byproducts. The degree to which e-cigarettes are harmful to the health of their smokers and those around them is not known and will not be for years since people will have to use e-cigarettes for some time before the effects of long-term exposure can be assessed. Thank you. Thank All right, you. thank you. Just uh, do we uh, have any questions or anything? Doctor? I have a question. One of the things that I've been, uh, I've, I've read all this material, I read your article and everything. Uh, one of the things that uh, maybe you can explain it for me, uh, you know, with, with a cigarette, you've got, you've got smoke, and, and, and the smoke is, varies where it goes by currents or whatever else is moving the air around. It seems to me that these e-cigarettes, when you, when, as I understand them, they have a water vapor, a, a vapor of uh, what they ex, ex, the person using it expends. It's, it's a vapor of water and nicotine and, and the stuff you say. How does that get transferred from that person, say, to a couple sitting in a restaurant booth uh, next to them? Because it, it's it's heavier than air. Yes. No. It's a it's a good question. Um, the, that it occurs, you could learn for yourself simply by walking into one of these vaping parlors and seeing how dense the air is with smoke, with this, this humor that's filling the air. How it happens is even if no um, vapor escapes the uh, e-cigarette as one is drawing on it, it enters the lungs and it is expelled. And one of the interesting things that happens that is unknown about how it will ha impact health down the line of others is that the particles that come out of the lungs are even smaller than the particles that go into the lungs. And so the people around the person that is exhaling the smoke is now, are now receiving the, the substances in that e-cigarette vapor more efficiently because the particles are so tiny. There's, it's much easier for them to get down deep into the lungs. But how does it physically move from my table across a space to somebody else over there? How does, how physically, how does that happen? Because only a proportion of what is inhaled through the e-cigarette is absorbed or stays in that person's body. The majority of what's inhaled is exhaled and that gets into the air, and you can literally see it as something that appears like smoke. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Can I follow this up on that? So when they exhale, the, the vapors that are coming out, is that first, they, the, I'm sorry, I've never really used one, I have no idea how this works. So they, they inhale it, the vapors come out at that point in time, and then they exhale, or are they exhaling at the time the vapors are coming out? They exhale the inhaled vapors. Okay. Uh, and so that's when they come out with expiration. So when we see pictures of this and we see all the, which looks to me like smoke, what is that? That's the vapors, right? That, those are the vapors, correct. And in that, are, are the particles in that, or is that just moisture, or, as Mr. Little said? Those are particles and breakdown products and the products themselves, unbroken down, that are in the liquid that's put in to the e-cigarette. So it's not just water or whatever that's coming it's out in that water. cloud. It's okay. not just water. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much. You're welcome. Appreciate thank you it. very much for allowing me to speak. 
Okay, next is uh, Allison Barton. Is Allison here? There she is. Okay. If you could keep it to three minutes. Yeah, way, so way could... lower. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Right into it, if you wouldn't mind. Is that Thank that you. good? Yeah. Okay, great. You. Alrighty, well, good evening, Mayor Kildee and council members. My name is Allison Barton. I'm a Camarillo resident, registered nurse, and I hold a Master of Public Health degree. I had the pleasure of providing you with technical assistance in Camarillo's comprehensive smoke-free uh, smoke outdoor air ordinance a few years ago, and it was a happy, healthy day for us when you passed it. As you know, several cities followed Camarillo's lead, providing the same healthful environment for their residents, workers, and visitors. Today, you're considering adding a new menace to the list of products covered by the existing ordinance, the electronic cigarette. You have read reports and heard statements from the CDC, from the California Department of Public Health, as well as our own Ventura County Public Health Department on the addictive, dangerous, and potentially deadly substances in e-cigarettes. You know now that they are, as, uh, they are ineffective as cessation tools. You also know that the long-term exposure effects will not be known for years to come. But what we do know about is the immediate effects of nicotine poisoning on children. According to the CDC's April 14, 2014 morbi Morbidity and Mortality Report, poison control calls because of e-cigarettes have increased dramatically from one call per month in 2010 to a whopping 215 per month this year. 51.1% of the calls were for children under the age of five for whom the amount of nicotine in one e-cigarette uh, can be a lethal dose. The poisoning from these cigarettes comes from ingesting or inhaling the fumes and or absorption through the skin. Additionally, manufacturers add sweet smelling flavors to the liquid in the e-cigarettes in order to make the fumes more palatable. In a father's compelling March 4th testimony before the LA City Council, Daniel Soto rec recounts his little daughter's exposure to electronic cigarette fumes at a park. She smelled the fumes, remarked how good they smelled, and asked her dad where they came from. He looked around to discover that the fumes were coming from a woman standing near them using an e-cigarette watching her child. If this isn't bad enough, it was easy to imagine that the same person could accidentally drop the device to be picked up by a small child, nicotine and other chemicals inhaled, ingested, or absorbed, nicotine poisoning ensuing. Camera's is existing ordinance includes private homes used as daycare centers. How tragic would it be to hear of a child finding an electronic cigarette at a daycare and ingesting it? If you understand the very purpose of city government to be to protect the health and safety of its residents, then it becomes clear that electronic cigarettes must be added to the city's existing smoke-free outdoor air ordinance. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Uh, any questions? Thank you very much. And thank you for your help last time. Thank you. <clears throat> Are there any questions from the council to the councilor or anything else at this particular point? Okay, with that, I'll request a reading of the title. Mr. Little had some comments. Did you have a comment or anything, Bill, you want to? Um, well, first of all, I, uh, yeah, I, I read the material here and it seems to me there's enough contradictory evidence that says that, uh, at least at this point in time, it's difficult to determine if that is going to be a secondhand problem with e-cigarettes as it is with uh, regular tobacco. Uh, from my from my standpoint, I'm assuming that anyone that smokes that cigarette, e-cigarettes are going to fi have health problems. I just don't see any way around that. And uh, so I'm not concerned about the person that's involved with the use of them because um, they're a legal product. And if someone wants to um, um, treat his body that way or her body that way, that's, that's their business. But I am concerned in what has been and what my questions were involved was if they do affect people like secondhand smoke, and I'm still having trouble figuring out physically how that that, that can happen. I'm, I'm, I have to take the word of the doctor that it can happen, but uh, that, that's my concern. It's not the person who's going to get the cigarette. 
uh, use the cigarette because they're making a conscious adult decision, hopefully, that uh, it is something they want to do. Your Honor. Mrs. Craven. Yeah, I, I have some comments, too. Um, I, too, recognize that, that there's, uh, I don't want to say that the research shows the difference. I think that the article shows the difference. Articles show uh, a difference in conclusions. Um, many, many years ago, there was a lot of uh, stuff put out by the uh, tobacco companies that sh uh, showed um, uh, evidence that, uh, medical evidence that, uh, cigarettes and their the, the output was good for you. Uh, I believe that the stuff that's coming out now saying that there's no no problems, no detrimental problems uh, to e-cigarettes uh, is being put out by the manufacturers or other people who will benefit financially from this. Um, I believe it's really easy for me to understand how the nicotine uh, and the propylene glycol and all the other stuff uh, trans uh, moves through the air. It's just like anything else, like an allergen, like a pollen that comes from a flower or something else that can bother you. It just floats from here to there. And if you're in its way, you're going to breathe it in. Um, as a person who has suffered from asthma from a uh, father who smoked three packs a day and finally died from lung cancer, I can certainly support this because whether there's evidence now uh, or not, I believe in the future, I really and truly believe that in the future we're going to find out that the secondhand vapors will uh, affect the uh, people who are near on the receiving end of uh, all of this uh, vapor and what's left, the, the, the water part might sink to the ground, but that residue will continue and be blown from person to person. So I, I can support this if it's approved. Yeah. Any other comments? Mr. Morgan? Well, I've got some similar stories that Ms. Craven has. My father, we, we used to kick him out of the house. You know, smoke, go smoke in the backyard. We're not going to be around the family. Same kind of thing, um, and he suffered from that. So in this case, we've got uh, an element. We don't know what it's doing. It's got some chemicals. Uh, you know, I don't know what they were before. I heard them when this came up, and it can't be. It can't be healthy for you. And it's going to be out in the public. It's going to be in. I think it's got to be treated the same as cigarettes, so we don't get people around it that don't want to be around it. Um, additionally, you know, we had things like DDT. That was good for crops. Long time DDT. We'd find out later the DDT wasn't so healthy after all. Uh, so I think we're going to have to play the conservative way and go with the cigarettes as cigarettes are controlled in this case. Any other comments? Uh, I'll just I, I agree that I think this is something that while it's it's not illegal and if someone chooses to smoke e-cigarettes in um, an appropriate spot in their own home, then that's you know their business. But I think when you come out and you're in the public, no matter what's coming out of that and what degree it is, it's blowing in other people's faces and other people's dinners and, and not knowing what's blowing around in that, those vapors is, is an, enough of a reason to, um, to say that it really isn't something that should be out in the public. So I think um, taking the approach that um, we need to um, take that, that conservative approach, I, I too could support this. Okay. With that, I'll request a reading of the title, please. Yeah, this is Ordinance Number 1088, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Camarillo, amending Chapter 9.24 of the Municipal Code relating to regulation of smoking. Move to adopt. Second. There's a motion to second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, please vote. Uh, that passes 4-1 with Mr. Little uh, opposing. Your Honor, I yes. just have a couple of questions. Uh, this was adopting. It had been introduced previously. We made a couple of changes. And when does it take effect? 30 days from today. 30 days from today. Will we be, what will we be doing to notify uh, merchants that they can no longer have these in the public, that they have to be treated the same in Camarillo as cigarette products, uh, behind the counter, behind a lock or something? 
I think we, it's up to, uh, I think it's our duty to notify people that the rules are changing in 30 days. Um, to answer your question, I, we will need more um, consultation with the city attorney because the display and retail of tobacco products is actually covered under a different municipal code section than the one, than the one you just adopted. So unfortunately for the sale of these products, we will need to come back to you with another text amendment. Oh, so this, I thought this, when this you only, ask. This only regulates smoking. It does not regulate the actual retail of the product. Okay, so they can still be out in the open. They, yes, they can. Okay. Okay, any other further questions? Um, do we have time to do a couple of the consent items or do we have a full, I want to come back um, with that, do we have a full uh, six to seven thirty. I would I would defer to to uh, Mrs. McDonald to. Mine she, might take a little while. On the um, the one that you uh -huh. okay. Mine, mine basically deals with the question I have about. Do you want to just do item E right now, and then we can yep. come back we'll, to see. We'll come back to to see later. Uh, Your Honor, uh, the general services item shouldn't take more than a couple of okay. Let's do moments that. if you'd like to do that. <clears throat> Do okay. you have a question, uh, Mr. Little? Did, do you know the question? Or <laughs> no, no, I was just saying that the general services item, which would be the next item on the agenda, will oh, take right. a Oh, we want to do that? Okay. We want to go to that. Uh, so, what, okay, do we want to take item E on consent or do we yeah, want to? Yeah, I'd suggest if we want to squeeze one in, do, let's do item E and then we'll break. Okay. Okay, let's item E on consent. I think that was Mr. Little. Yes, I just. This is an appointment to the Housing Authority, and, uh, and this person, uh, I don't recall that we had any uh, re interviews or anything else. Is this? Represents all of the cities, doesn't it? This, this item is actually similar to our Ventura County area on agency appointment, mm -hmm. where the area housing authority actually does the recruiting and interview process and then forwards the recommendation to us. So we actually aren't involved in the process at all. They just submit the recommendation, and it's a public member countywide. And it's for the um, area housing authority members to ratify the appointment. Well, do we, we have uh, representatives representing just the city of Camarillo, don't uh, we? Yes, we and, do. and we still appoint those. Yes. We interview them and uh, right. handle them like any other city right. appointment. Okay, right. that, that answers my question. Move the approval. <coughs> second. The motion is second. Please vote. That passes unanimously. So do you want a break or do we yeah. have? Okay. What we'll do is we'll recess and we'll be back at 7.30. Actually, I'm, I'm sorry. If we could read the closed session, that would I'm be I'm sorry. Helpful. Counselor, do you want to let me reopen? Could you read the closed session <laughs> item that we may have time to get into? Yes. If there's time, we would have a conference with legal counsel anticipated litigation pursuant to government code section 549-56.9-D4-1 case. Okay. With that, we're in recess. Okay, so we need to. Everybody ready? We're ready. All right, I'd like to reconvene the city council meeting, please, and let the record reflect that all the council members are uh, present. Ms. Craven, would you please lead us in the flag salute? Certainly, please rise. Place your hand over your heart and join me in the pledge to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Can I just remind everybody that the 14th, which I think is Friday, is Flag Day. 14th, okay, mm -hmm. June 14th. Is that Saturday? Yeah, Friday the 13th. Oh, that's right. Well, let's make it Friday the 14th. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, any amendments to this part of the agenda? No amendments. Okay, that's gonna get us down to the presentation. We have the Pleasant Valley Recreation Park District, <coughs> Springville Dog Park. Do we have somebody from, oh, there's the district. Let me make sure that your microphone is on and, 
Uh, yeah, this tur if you could really tuck into that because it's, we can, everybody can hear, so that'd be great. It's a little touchy, a little sensitive. Yeah, yeah just kind of like really close if you can. Okay, so you're, Thank you. you can proceed if you like. You're Amy, I take it. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for inviting me here tonight and having me uh, attend this meeting. My name is Amy Stewart, and I am the interim general manager right now for Pleasant Valley Recreation and Park District. Uh, if you have not heard, our current general manager for, I would say, the past seven years recently retired as of last Thursday. So unfortunately, he is no longer with us, but happily, he is enjoying retirement and spending a lot of time with his grandkids. So I have the pleasure of being here tonight. If I keep looking behind me, I will try to talk into the mic too because I am addressing uh, the residents behind me as well. Why are we here? Pleasant Valley Recreation and Park District. As you know, um, it's normally not common for the Recreation and Park District to attend a city council meeting like this and present. However, we work, we work closely with the city. Our two agencies work closely together and we have a great working relationship. Over the past month, I would say, we have heard of some concerns, um, some issues, and we thought that this would be a really positive way to address anything. So I'm hoping um, that we can establish from this meeting a clearer line of communication. I did watch your uh, city council meeting, I believe it was on the 28th, where you did have a number of residents uh, addressing concerns about Springville Park. So I did see that actually on YouTube. Uh, so that's a great way to, to get that out to the community. As you know, uh, any type of communication actually for the parks in this area should be directed to the Pleasant Valley Recreation and Park District. However, you as citizens have the right to go anywhere. Uh, but I just wanted to let you know that if it's a park here in the community, uh, besides Constitution Park and now Dizdar Park, please address any concerns to us. You may have seen in the past uh, the city and the park district working together to respond to citizen concerns. And if there is any type of overlap in anything, we do respond. And we will work together uh, whenever possible. And we have found from that that basically everyone benefits. And I'm hoping tonight that you will also benefit from this presentation as well. Let me go back to that last slide. Um, the group of people right there, that's actually a picture from the grand opening of Springville Dog Park uh, back in 2012. And I thought this little guy was so cute, I had to put him on there. So I don't know whose dog he is, but he's adorable. Are you serious? Oh, I randomly picked him. <laughs> Very cute. Um, his name? Hamish. Very cute. Uh, history and homework. How did we get here? How did we get to this point? Well. I would say back in 2010, maybe 2011, our board of directors, much like you at the city council, we were ap approached by a large group of people addressing the concern and the needs for another dog park, if not multiple parks in this community. So as you have heard at your council meetings, we heard at our board meetings years ago, and we heard it at multiple meetings. So. They presented themselves as a group of volunteers. Uh, their name, Friends of Pleasant, Friends of Camarillo Dog Parks. Uh, they are organized, they're a well-established group, and they came to us and said, look, we live in this community, we need more dog parks. Just to let you know, back in 2010 or 2011 actually, we only have one dog park here in this community. So we're a city of what, approximately 70,000, close to 70,000. We have one dog park and that's located at Camarillo Springs. There is a fenced in area there. There's also an off leash park. Dogs are free to roam throughout the entire park, but the, but the fenced in area is small. I would say it's less than 
maybe a quarter acre. So it, it is small. And we were one of the first dog parks in the area, so it's nothing compared to these amazing dog parks now. So they came to us as the, the Pleasant Valley Recreation and Park District and said, what can we do? How can we go about this? We want to perform, we want to handle this correctly, and we want to work with you. We asked them to establish community outreach measures. They did. They held, and this is, I've summarized this, but they have held multiple uh, town hall style meetings throughout the entire city. Uh, Numerous places, pizza places, local parks, uh, even in some of our classrooms at the community center. They came back and presented any type of findings or anything during our board meetings, much like they come here and present during the oral communication or public comment. So this was ongoing at our, at our district meetings. We determined Okay, after you did that, they brought back, yes, there is a need. We know that there's a need in this community. Now we had to determine a potential site. Where? And how are we going to do this? Obviously, location was a big factor. Since we already had a dog park at Camrio's, Cam, sorry, Camrio Grove Park, we didn't want to put another one directly next to that park. We wanted to serve the other part of the community. So location was a big factor. How did they go about and do that? Uh, they also looked at visiting other parks and surveying the use. So what did they see at these parks? Were they heavily used during peak times? Uh, what what was happening there? Were there baseball practices, softball practices, soccer? Seems like soccer is everywhere in this community. Uh, so they surveyed the use. And just as a reminder, this is primarily done through volunteer efforts through your community. They gauged the neighborhood awareness and responsiveness. So if I came to you, you're using a particular park, I spoke with you about it, how did you feel about the potential of a dog park in your area? After all of that was said and done, they came back and proposed three parks to us. Mission Oaks, Springville, and Charter Oak Park. All across the city. One's in the northern part, one is somewhat in the middle, and one is in the southeast area. How did we go about and notice and formally contact uh, these residents in this area? So after they performed their community outreach, we thought, okay, we need to send a notice or at least a letter to these residents. In this aspect, we worked with the city. Uh, we did receive an email list of residents living within 500 feet of each park, and a letter was mailed out to them. Information was put on our district website and also through multiple email blasts. Uh, we have about 9,000 people on our, our email list. So you could have received an email from us regarding that we were looking at these parks as potential sites. In addition, once we established that these three sites we were looking at, again, they went door to door. They did post notices. Uh, much like a flyer you receive in, in your door, not in your mailbox, but on your door, maybe on your doorstep, and talked with the neighbors in the area. They distributed multiple uh, pieces of literature. If there are any kiosks or anything in the parks or bulletin boards, that was placed on the bulletin boards as well. They also, which was a surprise to me, I actually didn't realize this, received neighborhood, uh, they started a neighborhood petition and got signatures from people in the areas. Then again, they brought it back to our community, our, our board meetings, and discussed their findings at our board meetings with us. So out of the three of those parks, actually two were established. I won't really spend a lot of time at Mission Oaks Park, but as you know, that's not a, a fenced dog park. It's an off-leash area. And I have to tell you that 
this is becoming a model park. Um, we have been contacted by other cities, other special districts. Um, how do you do this? How does it work? Because with an off-leash park with designated times, you don't simply don't have the wear and tear that you would have in a fenced area. We're, we found that at Mission Oaks Park, we're not dealing with maintenance, uh, as many maintenance problems. Uh, so actually, that is a model off-leash park, and we're seeing positive responses from that. This was, Mission Oaks was originally developed as a pilot program. If it didn't go over well, we weren't continuing it. It went over well, and the community kept asking for it. Charter Oak Park, we determined it was too heavily used. There was soccer practices out there. Um, during peak times, that park was just filled. So to, to add use on top of use already just didn't seem logical to us. We came to Springville Park. Again, using all those measures that I mentioned earlier, Looking at this park, evaluating the use, it seemed somewhat underutilized. We also, we were not as a park district receiving reservations to use this park as well. Um, some of the other parks that I just mentioned, we, we actually get reservations to use that park. So how do we proceed with Springville? Well, I have noted here that it's, I don't know if, my pointer's not working, but that's okay. Um, Springville Dog Park Improvements. Actually, it should be listed as investments now that I look at that. A dog park just doesn't pop up. We had to invest a lot into this. And without going into a lot of detail, first off, we had to put a fence in there. Just so you know, that money was raised through your community. That money for that dog park, for the fencing, was raised through community donations. In addition, and I didn't list it on here, um, we enhanced the parking lot. Okay, if this is going to be a dog park, we need to make this parking lot better. We slurried the parking lot. We added handicapped stalls to it. We even added a walkway. Aha, there it is. Um, that white pavement right there. Um, that wasn't originally there because we added the ADA stalls, then we added that walkway as well. Uh, we beautified this park. Uh, you will see an increase, and you have seen an increase in turf maintenance to keep this park green. Um, in addition, benches were added, two drinking fountains for dogs, uh, a kiosk was added, an informational kiosk. Several trees have been planted. I want to say to the tune of, gosh, in the dog park alone, eight, maybe seven, eight trees, not to mention all of the additional trees that we put in the parking lot as well. Uh, we installed sod in the high traffic areas. We installed pavers, uh, added poo bag dispensers, and, and I'm not taking this credit on for the district. Again, this, the ma vast majority of this was paid for by community members through donations. As you can see, um, The different locations of items on this park, without going into detail, um, parking lot, there's a small dog area. It's not very well mapped out here, but there is a small dog, or should I say a shy dog area. If you have a big dog that doesn't want to be in the big dog area, put him in the shy dog area. There's the tennis courts that everyone talks about right there. This is Via Zamora. I don't know if you can really see that. Uh, Tierra Santa right there as well. So these are the two main streets. There's the um, waterfall as well that people talk about. So this is just a general layout of Springville Park if you're unfamiliar with it. Okay, um, with Springville Park, there are some concerns, which is why we're here. Some of the concerns that we have heard of, um, ours, just to let you know with our parks, obviously our ordinance states that our parks are dawn to dusk. Springville, actually, uh, the hours are posted at approximately 7 a.m. It fluctuates. It just depends on the time that our staff is there to actually unlock the park. Um, so to help alleviate some concerns, and I did, I did hear concerns as well at our last board meeting, the Park District Board meeting on July 4th. Um, 
I don't know if any of you recognize me, but I'm actually sitting down there. Or I was at the last board meeting. Um, we can review the hours of operation if that's something that will help alleviate any concerns or problems. We heard that the park wasn't being locked at night. Um, that's simple. I've already addressed uh, the route of our staff and asked them to come in and modify their closing route. So you will see that park being locked nightly. Uh, with that said, I do have to address everyone. We have had so many locks cut off of that park. Um, we come back the next morning and the lock isn't there. Or another ranger will um, double check or they'll get a call about that area and the lock is cut off and they just locked it maybe two, three hours before that. So if any of you have a bolt cutter, stop cutting the lock off of our park. Um, anyways, so the park is being locked nightly. We can definitely try to close it sooner. However, that depends on what's actually happening with our park rangers. If you're unfamiliar, we do have park rangers that do close many of our parks and our facilities at night. So sometimes that closing depends on actually what they have going on right then and there. But I have asked them to modify their route and try to get there sooner. Parking. Um, I have heard that parking is a problem. Now, evaluating the parking lot, having our rangers evaluate that. Uh, we actually had a meeting with uh, district staff and city staff and met out there and just briefly uh, reviewed the parking. I believe, and I could be wrong, but I do believe that there is a potential um, two main times when the, the parking was a problem. We had a grand opening event, and then we had another annual event, which was our Dogtoberfest, and that was the celebration of the one year anniversary of the park. So I could see that. I could see that there may have been some overflow. Um, the Dogtoberfest, just to let you know, that was from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, there were vendors out there um, as far as doing free demonstrations for dog agility, free refreshments and coffee and donuts and dog treats. And so if you didn't make it out, that actually was a really neat event. Um, and people from all over the community um, attended that. So it was a wonderful event. Um, what we have noticed is actually, and I, I had just reviewed our park ranger report, we have received um, residential use of our parking lot after hours, which Okay, if it helps alleviate some parking from the street and helps the neighborhood, that's fine. Uh, actually, we have had people use that as a valet parking lot. So after hours, it's being used as a valet. Hey, that's very creative. Um, I was surprised to see that in our, our Ranger log. That's pretty good. Traffic and speed. I'm sure that there is some increased traffic. I, I can't deny that. And the reason why I say that, and I speak on behalf of the entire park district, is every park has peak use times. You see it. You see it in the morning, uh, before school or before work. You see it at lunch, and you see it in the evening. So I, I do agree. There probably has been some increased traffic during that time. Um, speed. I can't, I can't say to that. However, I have seen actually a speed trailer out there before. So I know someone was monitoring it, um, but I have seen that in the past. And again, an issue like this, this is something that um, the city and the park district, again, would work together on. Um, if we hear about it, we would definitely let the city know because this isn't something that we handle and vice versa. They've done the same with us as far as, I don't know, dog waste or a tree broken or something inside of the park. Crime. Uh, when I did hear about this, I actually called the police department and spoke with them and I was concerned. And with any of our parks, uh, we, we do have concerns. And when we do hear that there is increased crime in that area, that does uh, result in an increased uh, ranger attendance. So our park rangers do attend uh, or serve 
should I say, surveil some of our parks more often when we know at peak times, say there's been vandalism or something. So our park rangers do go and check that out when we do hear about it. In calling um, the police department, they actually said at that time that they have not had an increase in that crime or an increase in crime of that area. Now, I'm not here to say that that is or isn't true. I'm just relaying facts that I, I'm letting you know when I spoke with the police department. Um, this is my con concerns continued slide. Dog waste, flies, smell, odor. It happens. Um, I do agree when I do walk to the park, I do smell some of it, but I am right there, so I do smell some urine from the dogs. Um, however, this is simply through education and awareness and continuing to educate our community members, um, asking them, reminding them to please pick up after their dogs. And if you're a dog lover, you have no problem picking up orphan poop. And that is a homeless pile um, that has no owner and no one to pick it up and put it in its right spot. If you're a dog owner, you probably do this quite often. I know I do. Um, so again, I feel that we can help this um, through continued education and just effort and also self-policing. If you see someone who maybe they were looking the other way when their dog went to the bathroom, please, please let them know. Um, I spoke with our maintenance department about this and also watering the turf, obviously. Um, this is a, a catch-22. We're in a position right now where we're trying to reduce water. Um, but watering the turf, that helps to leach out some of that urine smell and the nitrate, so you don't smell it as much. Uh, cleaning the hardscape. Uh, at times when we did smell it or notice it, we did clean the hardscape. Um, so again, I've asked them to really take a look at that. So hopefully this will help and the residents in that area will see a difference. Okay, just a quick recap right now. Um, we have three dog parks. Camrio Grove Park that I mentioned to you earlier. We have Mission Oaks Park. Park, which isn't a designated dog park, but there is an off-leash area at certain times, and then also Springville Dog Park. And again, just a reminder, all of our dog park, all of our parks are dog friendly, but certain parks, when you use them, your dog has to be on a leash. So we do enforce that leash law. Okay, um, we have heard maybe Freedom Park is viable. Maybe we can use Freedom Park as a dog park. <sighs> to the average, should I say, to the average person going out to Freedom Park, you may not realize all that's out there because it is so large and it's so vast. This is just a quick, quick slide to show you what is out there. And we just labeled a, a few things so you can see it. Um, what you're probably seeing most is this green area. Okay, right now it's green. You don't see a ton of use right now for this area. However, just to let you know, that is a proposed area for baseball fields. That's in a master plan of Freedom Park that we have. Also, we have proposed baseball fields here. This park is actually the home to the Camrio Pony Baseball Association. They practice here, um, they have games, huge tournaments. Uh, the parking through this entire park uh, is, is actually full when they have massive tournaments and actually take up two sites, also at, uh, adjacent to the aquatic center. So at times you will see a baseball tournament being played at the, adjacent to the aquatic center at the old Los Altos schools and then also at this park because our tournament is so large. Um, we actually try to cancel everything else at that park because the tournament is so large. But also, we have the BMX park up here. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it's actually been redone, and there's a brand new corkscrew in it. It's pretty cool. So if you have a kid that likes that park, go check it out. Inline skating rink right at the top left. Um, dirt RC track. We have a remote control, remote control car track out there. But we have a dirt one and also a road track as well. Veterans Field, this is our large adult-sized field. Um, you can see the restrooms, 
And then again, this is Pony Baseball, Bronco 1, 2, Pony and Mustang fields. Um, this green area that you see is used regularly as a warm-up area. Also, our park office is out there, our park uh, department office. Uh, Freedom Center. Just so you know, this is used quite a bit for rentals, special events. Um, we actually use this quite a bit uh, for duathlons, this green area, the parking lot, uh, whether it's packet pickup, whether it's start, you start the race, you finish the race. Um, as another example, we have the start of the Malibu Marathon takes off in this park. Um, this summer, the Greek Festival will actually be utilizing this whole area. Parking lot, the side parking lot here. So in the middle of June, this whole area is actually quite full. Uh, so you can see this actually does get quite a bit of use. So right now, this isn't actually a viable option for a dog park because this is utilized. What now? Where do we go from here? Hopefully this presentation, and I'm not sure how long I've been to, ooh, 30 minutes, I'm gonna wrap this up. Um, hopefully we're aware of the concerns. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that this presentation has cleared some things up with you. Um, please contact the Pleasant Valley Recreation and Park District if you have concerns about dog parks. Obviously you're free to contact anyone, but hopefully we can respond sooner to you. Um, if it's not us, we will let you know, well, that's the city. A lot of times we do work together on overlapping issues. Um, if you're uncomfortable coming to maybe the park district or the city, we have a volunteer organization. And please feel free to communicate your concerns through them. Uh, actually, we receive multiple uh, emails, phone calls, and they're simply relaying messages to us because they are out in the parks all of the time. And um, I just wanted to say thank you. I hope this helps. And again, my name is Amy Stewart, so please feel free, contact me, contact our front office staff, go to our website for any information. Um, and if, if there is information that is wrong, uh, please feel free to tell us and we'll correct that. But I'm just hoping that this presentation did help. And I thank the city um, for agreeing to this. We actually talked about doing this as a, a joint meeting. Um, since we're both receiving uh, concerns about the park. So thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Any questions or anything? For her? Do you want to, yeah, you have a question? Jan, do you have a question for Amy? Yeah. yeah, I think your mic, is your mic holding? Thank you. Thank you. What, what is the size of this park and what is the normal size of a dog park? I don't know if there's actually a normal size, but this park is actually uh, approximately an acre. It's a little bit over an acre. It is used for within the fence of the yes for the dogs, and then what you have.